criticism, criticisms that we made of uh, expected progress. Okay, so it's a very, what I'm trying to say here is that you know, there, there's so many issues to worry about, but it's, it is a framework which you can have some flexibility over and you can try out different things. Okay. Okay, so let's um, look at um, some of the results you get from a value-added approach. And we do this twice, once for English, once for maths. Okay, and this is just a scatter plot of schools' value-added performances in, in uh, maths against English. And the way to think about this is what the model does, it corrects for the fact that schools serve very different intakes. And some schools have very low priority attaining intakes and others have very high priority attaining intakes. So what I show you here is in the hypothetical situation that all schools serve an identical average typical intake. Okay? So that's kind of a, it's a fair comparison. It's like what would we see if all schools had the same basket of pupils uh, and they are of typical uh, ability distribution? Well, we see a kind of a correlation of 0.5 between English and maths uh, value added effects. So doing well on one dimension, you tend to do well on the other, but it's not guaranteed. Okay, so that, that's kind of hinting at this notion that we need, well, these are just kind of one, two dimensions of school quality. There's clearly so many dimensions that one could explore. Okay, and it's very narrow what, 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 what one gets out of this analysis. Contrast this picture to what you would get if we failed to adjust for prior attainment. Okay, that's like a 5A star to C type approach. This is what we get. Okay, so make, making the adjustment for prior attainment we move to a situation where the differences between schools are far less pronounced, okay, and that's because a lot of these differences are related to the inputs. These schools tend to serve uh, more advantaged communities than these. Also, oh, sorry, also, we get a weaker correlation. Okay, 0.84 drops to 0.5 when we adjust for intake. Okay, why? Well, there's a common cause. The schools of excellent uh, maths GCSE results tend to have pupils who are doing very well at maths at age 11. Well, they're also doing very well at English at age 11 and therefore get excellent English exam results. Okay, so the strong correlation in unadjusted results just simply reflects a strong correlation in inputs. Okay. Uh, okay, something which you often see in research papers are, are these so-called caterpillar plots, okay, which is uh, an attempt to kind of visualize the extent of uncertainty in, in, in these estimates of school value added. Okay. And what do we see? Well, it's, you know, it's very hard to statistically separate out many schools from one another or the national average. There are only 180 data points per, per entity that you, you, you're creating a statistic for. These are tiny samples. We're not kind of saying, you know, what is the kind of... Uh, the average income of an Australian based on 20 million or whatever your population is. You know, this is, this is the, the, the quality of an institution with 180, 180 pupils. Okay, so it's very uncertain. And again, we can contrast what, would, what we would have seen had we uh, made no adjustments for inputs, which is this picture. Okay, so again, what we're doing is we're massively reducing the apparent differences between schools when we account for input, okay, because once again, these schools with excellent exam results tend to have excellent uh, children at intake. Okay. Oh. So we go from something which ranges from D's to D's to B's, or halfway between an A and a B, to something which is only between a C, D, up to just below a B. So a lot of the differences between schools are driven by inputs, not by the actual quality. Okay. How am I doing for time, Herb? Fine. Roughly. Yeah, I'm not you go. At least half an hour. Oh, right, great, great. Okay. So, with, so I've shown you expected progress, which is what is done. I've shown you value added, which is an alternative. Okay, but let's actually kind of compare them head to head and see do they kind of say different things. Okay, so here, remember, expected progress is calculated separately for English and for maths. The value added model is fitted separately for the English data and the maths and the maths data. And when I showed you these graphs and I said here we don't adjust for prior attainment, we're simply getting the means, okay, the average uh, maths result or the average English result in each school. 
Okay? So you can think of value added as adjusted averages, and these are unadjusted okay, for input. So the interesting thing here is expected progress, how does it correlate with uh, value added? Okay, uh, English, 0.79. Okay, so a pretty, pretty high correlation, right? How does expected progress correlate with uh, simple averages? No adjustment for prior attainment. 0.83. Okay, so our expected progress measure is more highly correlated with a pure attainment measure than it is with a pure progress measure. Is what it's saying. Remember, the critique of this was that it kind of makes some kind of partial adjustment for the intake by setting different target grades to different students. Okay. Likewise, for maths, we see the same thing. Expected progress is kind of more strongly correlated with uh, simple means than it is with adjusted means. Okay, so that's a bit, a bit concerning because expected progress is kind of purporting to kind of adjust or take into account kids' starting points, but it doesn't do a great job of doing that. Okay, so how about if we do this? Let's, let's uh, rank all 3,000 secondary schools by value added. Let's rank all 3,000 secondary schools by expected progress. Let's just calculate the difference in ranks and say, well, you know, would your school's position in this national league table change a lot if we flip from expected progress to value added? And we see what you might expect is a strong negative relationship whereby schools serving very disadvantaged communities would do better under value added okay, than they would under expected progress while schools serving very advantaged communities, very high prior attainment, would do worse under value added than expected progress. And again, this is because expected progress is biased in favor of schools with high prior attainment. And here we kind of worked hard to remove that bias. Okay. So, you know, you might think high correlations, 0 0.79, 0 0.74, doesn't really matter what we do, you know, Every change to performance uh, indicator can lead to kind of quite drastic differences. Okay. And in the English system, we have 97% uh, of schools are state, uh, sorry, about 95% of schools are, are state, which are the schools I analyze. But within that, we have about 160 schools which are uh, selective. Uh, they select on prior attainment, and that's why these schools, are, I've highlighted in black, are kind of a cluster to themselves. By definition, they have very high prior attainment. Okay, and so they, they kind of clearly, uh, you know, clearly matters to them what, uh, which one we use here. Okay. Uh, okay, so in terms of this comparison, value added versus expected progress, this is the last kind of does it make a difference uh, slide, which is remember that definition of an underperforming school. Okay, there's an equation that the DFE gives out. You are underperforming if less than 40% of your children get 5A star to C, but we let you off the hook if, uh, if uh, you're making great progress, those kids. So well, we, can, we can do this twice. Once the way the government does it, okay, where it's based on expected progress, the, 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 that, that balancing factor, and once when we base it on value added. And here we see no difference. Okay, it's the same 5% of schools get described as underperforming whether we use value added or expected progress. Okay. So really, I, I think what this is about is that this, under, this definition of underperforming is so heavily weighted in favor of the attainment measure, 5A star to C, that, that it doesn't have much bite, the, 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 the balancing role of expected progress or value added. Okay? So it's very hard to be let off the hook. You've got to be a rather extreme situation. So really, this underperforming, definition of underperforming is not based on school quality. It's based on raw exam results, is what I'm saying there. Yeah. Okay. Right. So what about other things? What about social class of the kids? Should we take that into account? Okay. We're looking, uh, for example, uh, on the My Schools website, the similar schools methodology. You guys take into account social class, occupation of the parents, their education levels, all of this kind of stuff. I haven't mentioned any of that. I've mentioned prior attainment. That, that doesn't go into similar schools methodology, right? <laughs> so we do opposite things. Okay. It turns out that previously, uh, in England, uh, we had something called contextual value added. This was basically what I've just shown you, the value added approach plus adjustments for additional factors. OK, 
okay? social class, ethnicity, gender, age of the students, and so on. Do they speak English as a second language? All of these factors have been shown to predict exam success over and above the child's starting attainment. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, you know, if, you, if the goal of the exercise is to try and make meaningful and fair comparisons between schools, you kind of want to adjust for everything which differs at baseline, which is important for how kids perform subsequently. You know, this is why we do randomized controlled trials, right? We, we, you know, because you want, you want the two groups to be otherwise equal, okay, other than the treatment that they're going on to receive. Uh, so, so expected progress actually replaced contextual value added, which was a value added model which adjusted for all these things down here, the free school meal status, which is our proxy for social class, ethnicity, neighbor deprivation, and so on. Okay. And here's a screenshot of contextual value added from its last year in 2010. And what, we, what was presented was an estimate of school quality plus the margin of error, or 95% confidence interval. So it also ticked the trying to communicate statistical uncertainty box, which was a criticism of expected progress. Now here, here is something which you, I'm sure none, none of you will guess, okay? S. What could S mean? Okay. Have you read the, uh, the one, one of the broadsheets at the weekend here, the Australian or something? There, there's the answer, because it said, Great Britain hit by snow. 300 primary schools in northern England closed. S means snow. It means in 2010, in January or February, Ashton Park School, there was snow, and it was closed for a couple of weeks. In that, and these kids were going to go and do their GCSE exams a few months later. Okay, so you, if you want to do contextual value added, you can even... <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, that's, going, uh, that's going a bit far, right? <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's the idea, is that all of these factors can affect subsequent performance. So the question is, well, why did the government reduce, uh, remove contextual value added and replace it with expected progress, given that everything I've said would seem to suggest that expected progress is inferior? Okay, so they give a nice statement in their school's white paper, and I've broken it into about five separate statements, and we're, we're going to kind of uh, respond to them. First of all, the measure is difficult for uh, the public to understand. Yeah, fa fair enough, right? I've just shown you these equations, this complex modeling, da 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 da, da. Your similar schools methodology, that's pretty complicated. There's old measurement models in there, right? So, you know, uh, under the bonnet, things be complicated as long as you kind of explain, you know, broadly what's going on and you make an effort to communicate the output. So, you know, this dry table might not be the best way of trying to communicate what's going on. A visualization might, might be more helpful. And there are, we've done some work looking at alternatives to confidence intervals, uh, more like probability statements. Okay. If you think about it, odds, if you're betting, that's an expression of uncertainty. Okay. So there are other ways than just margins of error. Okay. Also, it is going to be slightly odd uh, to say this, given that um, there are other kind of much, admittedly much lower profile uh, performance indicators on their website currently, which are, use the same methodology. Okay, so it's a bit, bit, bit funny criticism. Uh, then then the second, the second uh, sentence that I'm picking up on is to say, recent research shows CVA to be a less strong predictor of success, GCSE success, than raw attainment measures. Okay. This is never the idea. This is never the role of CVA. CVA is trying to measure the, the effect schools actually have on their pupils. So what they're saying here is saying a pupil's GCSE score, the output, is driven more by their Key Stage 2 score, the input, than by school quality, the process. Okay. That's, just a, that's just the situation in the UK. Is, you know, the differences bet between schools' exam results are heavily driven by their starting attainments. So that seems like a funny kind of criticism of CVA. Uh, then they kind of go on to say, it also has the effect of expecting different levels of progress from different groups of pupils on the basis of all of these factors that you're adjusting for, ethnicity, uh, free school meal status, and so on. And they think that that is wrong in principle. I mean, the reality is that, you know, kids in disadvantaged circumstances do make less progress than others. And if you're trying to hold schools accountable for their results, you, you, you've got to take that into account if some schools serve a very high proportion of disadvantaged pupils and others don't. Uh, you know, 
So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a grim grim world that we live in, but that's the reality of it. And if you're trying to hold schools accountable or school choice, you know, you've you got to kind of make fair comparisons. Uh, so then they go on to say it's morally wrong to have an attainment measure which entrenches low aspirations for children of, uh, uh, as a function of their background. So yeah, you know, by adjusting for social class, you, you're effectively allowing children you're rewarding schools with relatively lower performances on, for these kids than other ones. You, you're kind of setting uh, a lower bar, if you like, for disadvantaged pupils to cross over than advantaged pupils. Okay, so in a way, you are setting different aspirations. But in a way, by doing that, you actually make it feasible for the school to get some reward out of the low prioritainers, and so they actually expend some effort on them. If you don't adjust for... Uh, uh, you know, low social class or particular ethnic groups, and they have very high t targets, then the school's not going to bother, okay? Because they're never going to get the reward from them. So you can argue these things, you know, quite easily the other way. And uh, I'm being a little bit provocative here because some of you guys might agree with some of these statements. Yeah, and that, that's, that's, that's fine as well. It's good to have a discussion. Uh, the fifth one is we should expect every child to succeed and measure s schools on how much value they add for all peoples, not rank them on their ethnic makeup of their intake. The whole point of adjusting for ethnicity is to remove it from the school effect so that you aren't ranking schools by ethnicity. So this is completely back to front. You know, you adjust for factors so you don't hold schools responsible for them. So, uh, so there's some kind of confused thinking, I'd argue, in uh, this school's white paper which led to the removal of CVA uh, and its replacement of expected progress. Uh, so CVA, you know, all these performance measures are, are flawed in all different ways. You know, I'm, not, I'm not kind of saying CVA is brilliant, but uh, some of the thinking you could argue about, and clearly expected progress has its own quite severe flaws, I'd argue. Uh, now, I'm going to shunt onto the conclusion. Sure. Yeah, so we'll skip this. Uh, just, just to note, I won't go into detail, just to note, this is something which uh, the last couple of years England have gone in for, which, which, uh, which could be coming your way, I don't know, which is the notion that schools can have different effects for different pupils. Okay, so a school which is great for a low prioritizing kid who's struggling academically might not be such a good school if you've got a really high-flying kid. Okay? So schools can have differential effects for different types of pupils. The schools which are best for boys might not be best for girls. Da, 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 da. And so they're starting to report all of these statistics I'm showing you separately for different subgroups of pupils. Here are the results for poor kids. Here are the results for wealthier kids. Here are the results for uh, boys and for girls and so on. The problem is that some of these subgroups are tiny. And they do say, you know, we won't publish anything with uh, five or less pupils. Okay. And the reason they give is statistical disclosure, so you can't identify the kids. And that's, that's a good reason not to do it. They don't seem to pick up that actually five, pu five pupils is also rather small in terms of statistical, in terms of reliability or in terms of uh, the, the precision. They don't seem to mention that. Uh, I, shouldn't, I, I must be careful because uh, they're, they're, there's no one here from the DfE is there to defend, you know, because, uh, you know, you can, I'm giving a particular argument here. Uh, but you can see separate numbers for low attainers, middle attainers, high attainers, and so on. Okay. Uh, just to say, you can, you can extend the multi-level value-added approach to random coefficient models to kind of uh, to get that. And if you did do that, you see very imprecise uh, plots for the low, middle, and high prior attainers predictions of value-added effects. Okay. okay, so to conclude, um, really what I've done is I've... Um, Okay, we had a bit of an overview of, of what's been going on in the UK, but I really focused on expected progress, which is currently being used. Uh, and I drew attention to three, I mean, you can no doubt come up with others, criti critiques of this, but I, I came up with this borderline effects criticism that you're incentivized to focus on these, Americans call them bubble kids, the ones very close to the thresholds. Uh, I showed that there's a very strong relationship between expected progress and prior attainment, which biases this measure in favor of schools with very advantaged intakes. And I said, you know, these are small samples of data. We need to go, go some way to showing, you know, don't, don't take all of this stuff completely at face value. There, there, there's a lot of noise here. Uh, the value-added approach I really used to kind of really kind of to highlight that, to reinforce those arguments. But it does provide quite a nice framework 
where there's a lot of knowledge about the likely problems you might run into. Uh, but clearly, there are many statistical concerns. I, I mentioned missing data briefly as well, for example. There's kind of measurement error issues and so on. And there's many more general concerns, which I haven't talked about at all. You know, all the teaching to the test type, type arguments, the stress for the kids involved, is this a useful exercise and so on. Uh, I should um, be fair to the DFB. They're getting rid of expected progress. Okay, they haven't entirely given their reasons why, but they are going to replace it with something called Progress 8, which is back to a value-added approach. Okay? Uh, but, uh, and, and they will communicate uncertainty, but they will not make any adjustments for ethnicity or free school meals or anything like that. So it's still just adjusting for prior attainment and ignoring all other factors. Um, but they're not going to use a multi-level approach. They're using something else which appears a little bit a little bit ad hoc, so I'm quite interested to take a look at that to see what its properties are. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. We've got plenty of time for uh, questions, and I also wanted to let you know that uh, the video of the presentation will be available and there will also be a separate uh, uh, set of slides that will be available and so we'll let you know those will they'll be on our IPPE website so if you weren't able to get all of the details uh, uh, you'll be able to get those later on but let me start off with one question can you go back to your slide on <laughs> here uh, on the sure uh, Issue. Yeah, so this is an area of interest yeah. of yours, yeah. yeah. <laughs> of course. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is a particular area of interest of mine. This mm. is the uh, the school effect. And one of the things that uh, one of my uh, PhD students at Oxford did, uh, all of these are based upon manifest variables. That is, they mm. don't take into account uh, measurement error. And uh, what we did, uh, well, uh, one of our colleagues before us, uh, Peter Timms, uh, came up with what he called uh, the phantom effect. Mm. And the phantom effect is that if you add unreliability to the individual student score, then this goes down and this goes up because uh, this is less affected by the unreliability than the individual sure. student. So because we're adding it mm. uh, by a simulation, we know that it's not true, but it looks like it's better. And if you control for unreliability mm -hmm. uh, in here, this goes down. And uh, so, but what was really interesting about this is that so, it's so, all right, so this is bias. Well, maybe we should throw it out. But what happens is, is that actually this, even though this measure is biased, measure of school average ability, it helps in terms of making this more accurate because it picks up on reliability mm. at the individual student level and so even though it's a biased measure it was better to leave it in in terms of uh, this value added to the school but this is a really weird measure a lot of people would look at that as error myth. yeah this so this is a, it's a bit and left over this is what every, this is what all the schools are ranked on. yeah so uh, what some people <laughs> look at is some sort of leftover residual error message, uh, error is really the main yeah. issue of it. Yeah. And so we were looking specifically at this and saying, oh, well, this is biased and we shouldn't be using it. And at least we need to be putting in uh, some controls for unreliability, yeah, 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 even yeah. if they're just good, good estimates to uh, say. Yeah. And this, in some cases, this actually goes negative. Yeah. So that the school average uh, ability has a negative effect on mm. uh, the outcome. So with Peter Tim's data, uh, where we could, uh, where we had the individual scores, and we could correct mm. for unreliability. Uh, this started out slightly positive, but it actually went negative. So the effect of school average mm. ability on subsequent attainment was actually negative. But what the interesting bit was is that uh, for this sort of value added model, it was important to leave it in because this is really the only thing that's important. This mm. is not really mm. important. Yeah. This is what's important. And so one of the issues that uh, George and I have been talking about and uh, what we'd like to do is to possibly bring together these uh, various approaches where mm. he's looking at a purely multi-level manifest model yeah, and yeah. some of the modeling mm. that we've been doing where we're looking 
more with our big fish little pond effect, but uh, also looking at a combination of uh, the latent variable where we take into account measurement error and the multi-level, and real complicated to do, and whether or not we could even begin to do that mm -hmm. with the complexity of the contextual value added model that's used in UK is, is, is sort of problematic. But I just thought I would mm -hmm. go ahead and bring a yeah. comment. Well, no, I think in, uh, in general, doing sensitivity analyses of, of these models to things like uh, measurement error or, or equally missing data, uh, different assumptions that we're making implicitly here, and if we vary them, you know, to what extent are the results going to vary? Uh, and those are useful exercises to do, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Let's open it up to other questions. There surely must be a whole range of different questions. Uh, well, this sort of follows on from your point, Herb. I'm wondering if anyone in this context is talking about causality. So you're, you know, you subscript J there, as you point out, Herb, is, you know, part of the residual variance, otherwise known as the stuff that we don't know about. Mm. And now we've interpreted the stuff we don't know about as being the school effect. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. You know, as you add more parameters to account for SES, etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm that's going to shrink and shrink and shrink and yeah. shrink. And if you throw the kitchen sink at it, there'll be no variation left to, be, to have a school effect. So really what this needs to come back to, I think anyway, is out of the statistical realm and actually think causally. And is anyone mm. talking about this in this literature? Well, I mean, uh, implicitly, that's what you're, you're trying to get, is you try and make more and more careful adjustments for the things you don't want to hold schools responsible for, their inputs. You're trying to narrow in on a total you know, uh, causal effect. But okay. What are you trying to narrow in on? Because can you, re as I think you alluded to, can you really separate out a school effect from the sort of each of the aspects that make up the community of a school? Well, no. I mean, I think that was that selection argument, which is uh, important. Yeah these kind of biases. But ultimately, by, by making all of these adjustments, you're trying to narrow in on the causal effect. And then as a sec second stage, you might then try and introduce the actual, you, know, you try and decompose it by putting in characteristics of the schools which they do have responsibility for, their teaching styles and so on, uh, to try and unpick well, what actually is this thing, which is a much harder uh, enterprise because it's very hard to measure all those different dimensions uh, and policies which schools actually do. So this is, yeah, so like a total catch-all effect and we don't really know what's in it. Um, yeah. Is that unpicking conversation happening very much? Well, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of... Part of, yeah. of the problem with the causality is that it's pretty much impossible to... It's a very slippery term. And if you want causality, then you probably have to uh, randomly assign students to schools. And I know that's how you look at causality. You, uh, mostly you, uh, you get a true experimental uh, design. And if you don't have a true experimental design, then the whole notion of causality gets pretty slippery. And if you look at this value, it's a residual value. And so you're trying to control for as much as you can. You say you throw in the kitchen sink. Well, uh, UK has done a good job mm. of throwing in the kitchen sink. And that variance is down to as little as 5% of mm. the variance uh, in the uh, scores is accounted for by the school that you go to. And even that 5%, we know that any residual variance that isn't accounted for is probably a bias towards that. And so uh, uh, the bias is uh, the you know, positive attainment. Schools that uh, have better intakes to begin with, those are probably, and if we can't control for all of that, mm. that's going to probably bias that. And, but what's amazing to me was that uh, with the model, which is essentially a kitchen sink because of all the yeah. things that are thrown into it, that the variance is down to as small amount as it is. Mm. There are some areas um, in the UK now having lotteries for school admissions, so that is random assignment of kids to schools. So in principle, one could look at that to try and say something like that. But 3,000 secondary schools, if you, if you know this kind of potential outcomes framework, each child has 3,000 potential outcomes. It's a horrid causality uh, problem. You can view it as a missing data problem as well, really. We, we don't observe any of these potential things. So I, if I just added to that, I think in America there was recently a study done Weber on the, you know, uh, picking up the lottery schools using mm. the lottery system and then compare their results and exclude the effects from the typical value added effect and actually show quite similar results in terms of picking up high value added schools. Um, can I make a 
point about the comment about the comparison that in statistical concerns that you have picked for those schools um, for the expected growth measure and the value added mm -hmm. measure. Um, we've done quite a lot of analysis of the value added measures and comparing them to the um, expected growth measure, which uh, were constructed in a very similar way to what you have done uh, over there in the UK. The other concern, the fourth concern, would have been the volatility in the expected growth measure. So, using a multi-level measure that you would have, you have used here, you've got a, a shrinkage effect of yeah, sure, yeah. base estimates, which you would normally be part of the multi-level model, yeah. which shrinks the you know the initial school effect towards the mean. So, in that, so if you just take the raw expected growth, which um, does not adjust mm. for reliability, uh, our mm -hmm. estimates. One, one of five small schools would have jumped from the top category to the lowest category in one, yeah. year, one, one year to the next. But if you use evaluated modeling, where then you adjusted the school initial school effect by reliability, um, the proportion of the small schools are not um, over the percentage at the low and yeah. high yeah. end of the uh, distribution of school effect. So I think that that's a really, there's a recently a paper to talk about that when you, when you validate the school effect, you have to look at the proportional effects, which is to make sure the value added effects, you know, they are low SES schools have an equal chance of getting there and um, expected of course, certainly is not mm. performing mm. in that part of the um, low performing schools will not have the equal chance in the expected growth as well. Can I ask a, a, a technical question on dosage effect? Because that's a kind of practical question. So, are, are there what effects? A dosage effect. Dosage so effect, yeah. We have lots of the school students. I don't know uh, mobility in the UK, mm. but I know that there's a lot of mobility in the USA, and certainly there's a lot of mobility in, here in government schools. Students change schools and transfer between schools over the during the measurement period. Um, I think the, see, the contextual value added model that you have done using the random effect model have um, only included the kids who stayed in the same school over that period. And um, I've seen the fixed effects which were which are implemented in America, mm. in the States, using the dosage effect, which is pretty much you weight the student's growth mm. by the length of the time the yeah. student is enrolled yeah. in that particular school. I have not seen a practical implementation of it in the random effects model, and I was just wondering whether you can comment on that. Uh, yeah, sure. The um, first thing to say is that um, in the CVA model, um, it, a covariate goes in for kids who have moved recently. Okay, um, and they, these kind of movers tend to do worse. There's a negative effect of that. But uh, in terms of the uh, random effects, you, you treat you're assigning all of a child's progress to the final school they attend. Okay. okay, so you're ignoring the sequence of schools they've attended. Now, uh, there's an extension to uh, multi-level models called uh, multiple membership structures or multiple membership models, which uh, in theory allow you to take into account the sequence of schools a child attends. And yes, you use, for example, the proportion of time they spend in each school, and then you attribute a child's progress to the different schools in that way. Uh, the problem with that is that, uh, like all models, it makes assumptions. And one of the assumptions is, for example, um, that there are no, uh, the, the sequence of schools you uh, attend are independent. But in reality, it's unusual to change schools during secondary schooling. A kid might, and the kind of situation, situations where it happens is a child might get uh, expelled, for example, and then they go from one, they're effectively going from one bad school to another. So it's not an independent series of schools, it's a correlated series. Uh, the, the, these models tend to also assume that there are no interaction effects between the, seek, the series of schools you attend and so on. So yes, there are ways of extending these models to take into account mobility, but there are assumptions in doing that uh, and you'd want to test those if you could. Yeah. I was wondering if I can get references to what I was going to say what kind of, I'm not sure whether the MAO Wenglard has extended enough MAO model, mm. multi-level model when it does that. Um, so, yeah, going yes. To the yeah. Yeah, yes, I've got a, I've got a, I've written a paper on this, and ML, and it uses ML Win, so I'll okay. give that to you. Yeah, yeah. But there are, there's still, you know, there are problems with it. But it's, it'll be nice to compare the approach that you're doing to that. Certainly. What's the effect of a prior school? Uh, how much effect does that have on the value added model? So that's, that's um, so another thing you can do is uh, yeah, bring in the the, uh, the schools attended in a previous phase of education. 
Okay, so we're focusing on the improvement you make from ages 11 to 16, but what about the school you attended in primary school? In? And, and that's, in a lot of research has shown that to be pretty important as well. So these kind of cross-classified or cross-random effects models are, are used there. But again, they're making assumptions about um, you know, to what extent these school effects are independent and whether they interact. These kinds of assumptions are being made. You need to be a bit careful about that. Yeah. I, I guess it's probably reasonable to say that all these models are wrong in, in general. So yeah. Statistics, all models are wrong. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, a matter of how wrong they are. It's and George Box quote, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. oh, yeah. Uh, I'm just interested in the way that you presented um, the value-added scores in that they aren't residuals, like yeah. they're not positive and negative centered around zero. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I guess I just wanted to clarify firstly that if there was systemic improvement at every school suddenly went up grade, uh, the, the graph would just go up one yeah. grade. And, Secondly, um, how would you intuitively interpret that adjusted score? What does it mean? Um, well, so what I've done here, yeah, so, so you're right. Um, I, uh, okay, so what, what, what is est we estimate these UJs, which are centered around zero. But what I've effectively done is added a constant onto them for these uh, graphs uh, here, for example. Okay. Um, and, so, and the constant I added on for English is about kind of, uh, you know, 7.1. Okay. And that was just the national average. Yeah. Yeah, and that was just to kind of put it onto a metric. And that's why I was kind of saying, imagine that every school has a typical basket of children. Okay, how would they perform? Well, this is how they'd perform with that. Some would be getting uh, C grades, others pushing on for a B grade, and so on. But that's a, it was a cosmetic choice. Um, one could equally, you know, do what the government did previously, ah, oh, okay, the government also didn't present them centered around zero. They added 1,000 onto everything, okay? And one of the reasons for that was, what if you add 1,000 on, on, onto these numbers, which are which, um, half are negative and half are positive, because the, the UJ is centered on zero, then all schools have a positive effect. Because the last thing you want to tell a parent is that you, your, your child goes to school which scores minus 950. Yeah, oh, sorry, my, sorry, which scores minus 50, for example. Um, so that's, that's why they did it there, uh, centering on 1,000. So I just centered on something else, uh, just to try and make it a bit more uh, interpretable. Well, these scores are all relative. The, uh, the yeah. GCSEs are an absolute score. Yeah. And, yeah. But then there's huge controversies as to whether they're constant from one year to the uh, next. Great, great, great inflation. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Comment on that? Uh, well, I'll show you it because we've got the 94 table. So nationally, in 1994, 43% of children were getting five good grades. And in 2013, uh, we, we are now at 60%. Uh, so we've gone from 43% to 60% in that 20 year period. So there's a massive improvement in national intelligence. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, there's all these criticisms of grade inflation and, and so on. But also teaching to the test, the more we've had this culture, the more schools have become successful at uh, coaching their kids into doing, into doing this and focusing on those bubble kids. And so it's very hard to unpick you know, what's really going on. Yeah. Uh, we've got similar schools as well, similar schools methodology. It's much simpler than yours. And I don't mean that, in a, I wasn't saying that in a, in a kind of superior way. It's kind of pretty, pretty basic. <laughs> Differentiated evaluated models. At the same time, we've got this expected progress model going on. Have they, have they added that to the public websites? Or? Yeah, I mean, you've got, there's, a, there's a huge amount of, this is the public website, and there's a huge amount of information on there, uh, and there is documentation. You know, the, you, you, know you, you guys might be positive or negative about the MySchool's website, but the, the documentation, I, th I feel, is much bit stronger than what we've got for ours. Uh, this doesn't feel like a huge effort to kind of make this information accessible. Um, so everything's being published. Or, um, those uh, differential effects. Um, we've got similar schools methodology here. We've got different value. There's, there's some value added stuff. There's some expected progress stuff. 
There's kind of closing the gaps, achievement gaps between disadvantaged and other groups and so on. Huge array of numbers. Uh, it is all documented, but pretty dry, you know, technical anyone, documents. Has anyone researched the impact of that? Have they been looking at how... Uh, uh, well, does, does, does anyone actually look at this stuff? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, it's an amazing, amazing amount of media attention it gets. So, you know, but, uh, yeah, to what extent parents actually use this information to choose schools? No. Okay. No, it's not my not my area. There is there is research out there on that. But. Um, George, I've got two questions. One is relating to um, leadership, the impact, I guess, of leadership and culture, mm -hmm. and what you're seeing in, in terms of the, mod the models. And the second one is around differential um, value added. I was just recently reading um, Malcolm Gladwell's book, and he looked at the cohort effect of you know being a small fish in a big pond or a big you know, big fish in a small pond, and some of the impact educationally as students go through from primary, high school, and then to university, and then mm. in terms of success later on in life. And I was just wondering if some of that comes into your uh, differentiated um, value-added model. It's not, it's not, I, I, not really my, I can't really answer your questions, I think. It's not really, not, not really my area, leadership and culture. Yeah. Uh, I, should I, say, I should say I'm... I guess, going, to, I, I guess to an extent, I mean, uh, particularly in the more complicated Models are certainly issues of disability and uh, and ethnicity that we're looking at as control variables, but uh, not necessarily looking at it uh, as uh, contextual uh, sorts of effects. And in that book, uh, the focus of there was more on my work on the big fish little pond effect, and so there the outcome variable was self concept uh, rather than achievement. And I'm sure that those effects are going to be stronger on self concept. Uh, those the, uh, the negative peer effects are going to be stronger on self concept uh, than they are uh, on achievement measures. Although I guess. In most schools, uh, there's a tendency to grade on a curve. And so if you grade on a curve, then you get huge big fish little pond effect uh, sorts of things because you, uh, uh, an average kid uh, will get low scores if they're in a highly academically selective school and they'll get good scores if they're uh, in a school where most of the kids are of low ability. So there are those sorts of effects on school grades. But how much effect they have on achievement is is a different story. And uh, but then then I guess the big picture is looking at how much that each of them have on subsequent. So some of our work is uh, looking that uh, that the the uh, academic self concept in high school has this big effect on long term attainment and uh, and uh, long term. Uh, occupational aspirations as the achievement does. So it's, it gets very complicated. But that's clearly beyond the scope of what is looking at the effects mm -hmm. of schools. But it is, it is maybe an important one. And I guess the UK uh, system is now at least conceivably able to do that because uh, these databases that they have now uh, are now following kids into university as yeah, well. Yeah. And so there's going to be a chance to look at those sort of long-term effects. And some of the people in our, uh, our, our program are now uh, using the, uh, the longitudinal uh, LSA data to try and look at uh, some of these long-term effects. But the, the, the statistical modeling gets really complicated to do that. Mm. Thanks, Herb. Yeah. So, so just following up on the idea of broadening uh, some of the outcomes, mm. um, and, and also, uh, I suppose, partly relating to your throwaway lines about the importance of teachers, mm. um, I've been very <laughs> struck by, by how in the UK there seems to be a lot of interest in well-being in students, mm -hmm. and a lot more now about measuring that and the um, evidence that that does make a difference to academic attainment. So I wonder to what extent one could apply some of these models to changes in well-being, mm. and then in turn, the knock-on effect of that on the uh, academic attainment, mm. and the reciprocal mm. relationship, of course. There as was, well yeah. As, as well as sort of things Herb's talking about, later, yeah. later effects. In um, maybe 2009, 10, there was a talk of a, we're gonna, we were going to have a school report card which was going to give a much uh, wider range of outcomes, and not just educational ones, to give some of these well-being uh, outcomes and so on in schools. And that never materialized. I mean, 
One, one thing which I didn't talk about here, which is very interesting, is how um, governments have changed since 1992 and how education ministers change. And with each of these changes, suddenly you're going to get a change to the tables and get pulled one way or another. And that was something that was clearly being floated at the time, but, but didn't, didn't take off for whatever reasons. Um, I suspect it will come round again, and maybe they'll have a kind of a, a real effort at it. Um, yeah. But currently, these are purely educational focus. There's a little bit of education destinations. You're mentioning the university stuff going in already here as well. Yeah. yeah um, you know, we've talked about sort of school improvement, and that's been a big focus in New South Wales lately. Um, I guess my question would be how far you think um, changes in the UK sort of accountability um, framework for this included. Um, is it about school improvement or yeah, yeah. so um, there's a whole industry in the UK of uh, charities and kind of uh, some commercial companies providing uh, support packages to schools using all of this data and really trying to tailor it to schools needs uh, and and all of that is a lot of that's commercial, so it's not accessible for me to kind of analyze. Um, but there, these charities are really trying to support, use this data to support schools to improve. And so, uh, I mean, that sounds kind of quite constructive. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's, not, it's not something which comes, which is immediately here in these official tables. But there is